Hello, everyone. My name is Layla, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about how Israel and the United States use dance as a form of soft power. This includes the study of Palestinian dance, as well as how dance is used for resistance, submission, and erasure in service of Western colonial projects. Before I begin, I want to thank Nicole for inviting me uh, to speak here today. Nicole has been a fierce advocate for Palestine uh, well before October 7th, and one that we can all learn from. I also want to thank JVP Philadelphia for helping facilitate this event, Studio 34 Yoga Healing Arts for providing us with this beautiful space, um, Thinking Dance for generously extending coverage, and Philly Cam for ensuring that it is accessible. Now, before we begin, I want to make some disclaimers. Um, the first is regarding funding. Fortunately, Nicole was generous enough to facilitate this trip, and I offset the cost by turning it into um, a visit with friends and such. So in lieu of supplementing travel, all donations um, at the door today will be given in instead to Samud. Um, Samud is the Arabic word for resilience. It's a newly formed emergency response organization that caters to Palestinian needs out of Egypt. It also happens to be the organization, the, the how do I explain this? The, my dear friend Venen's sister's organization. So if you have any questions, give us a wave. You can ask her about how the money is going, but um, it's been doing some really great stuff with civilians who have um, recently entered through the Rafa Crossing. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you can be sure to check her out. And then also um, in the QR code that I'll show at the end again, you can access the funds through that. And finally, before we get started, I want to give one last disclaimer. I trust that you're here with the right intentions, um, but I want to make it clear right away that I'm not here to argue about whether or not Israel is committing a genocide. It is. I'm not here to argue about um, whether or not Israel, with the West's help, has displaced millions, because it has and it continues to. And I'm not here to pretend like dance is immune to this violence and imperialism, because it's not. I say all this because today, I'm here to talk with you about what's happening in occupied Palestine and how we're all implicated in it. This should not be treated as an isolated event or something that happened all of a sudden. For those of us intimate to the situation, we have known in our hearts that Israel, with the United States and other world powers, was always capable of these heinous and egregious crimes. We've been screaming it for 75 years. The world has just chosen not to listen. But since October 7th, we've been asked to educate and inform the public of what's going on, despite being ignored for doing just that in years prior. It's not until moments like these that scholars such as myself are given a platform, a moment when grief is swallowing us whole. Our careers have already come at a cost. We are constantly doxxed, threatened, and harassed. Opportunities are taken away from us. We are labeled troublemakers and deemed unworthy as scholars in the field. Yet this is nothing compared to people on the ground suffering for sins that they never committed. In moments like these, we have to remind ourselves of our priorities, which should always be in an unrelenting pursuit for justice. Institutions will try to convince us otherwise, but an artist who does not engage and show up for the people has no value. The system will convince us that creating work devoid of intellectual inquiry or critique is still an asset to society, but this is a lie and it's one that is meant to serve them. It's our duty as movers and shakers of culture to show up and defy the systems that oppress us. As such, I ask that you bear with me as we challenge the histories we were brought up in. I imagine that some of us were raised in or around modern dance. Just so I can get an idea, show of hands. Great. And modern dances are a particularly potent form of soft power by imperialists, and it's one that racist ideologies do not want threatened. That's why we have to be laser focused on its history. We don't need to get distracted with cancel culture by honing in on a handful of names. This isn't about 
specific people. It's about a system that we need to reckon with. We also need to check ourselves. We don't want to center our own guilt as we deliberate over past dance we've supported, nor should we absolve ourselves of any past wrongdoings. Enthusiastic support of fascism is not required for complicity toward it, and once we know better, we should do better. Another pitfall we want to be weary of is defensiveness towards certain people or works. It's not worth getting upset over that one choreographer who once created a great piece because frankly, um, that's not in question. That's not what we're here to talk about. This is something that's much bigger. And we're not gonna get into movement analysis either because we're not there yet. One day we'll get there, but right now, does it matter if this person did a tendu, what, is it, what does it mean? Is it a symbol of this or is it a symbol of that? It doesn't really matter, it's a fascist government. So we'll get there one day, but that day is not today. Today we have to drive home that imperialism is woven into the fabric of modern dance. It's not about one or two bad players, it's a neoliberal logic that has infiltrated how we create our work. That being said, and before we get started um, into our kind of dance history, I wanna take a minute to do some very, very brief Palestine 101. This won't be comprehensive. It's just meant to give us a, a foundation that we can draw on. So with that in mind, I want to emphasize that this should not be the extent to which you read or learn about it. There are so many great resources out there, and our mission today isn't to provide a general history of Palestine and its occupation. It's to look at Zionism's role within modern dance. But if you get nothing else from this lecture, it should be clear that Israel is an apartheid state. A lot of the comments that I get surrounding my work is that my research is unfounded because Palestine is actually a thriving democracy. But as a scholar and as a human, I have to tell you that it's not. Israel is an apartheid state and it's committing an unchecked genocide against the Palestinian people. And this did not begin on October 7th either. This traces through, there, that way. It thinks I'm shorter than I am. It traces through to the formation of the Zionist movement, a European export that was then used to justify the displacement, erasure, villainization, and murder of its indigenous population. And to do this, Israel has created an apartheid system where there are tiers of what rights Palestinians are given. So just because a Palestinian of 48, aka Palestinians that remain during the Nakba, have Israeli citizenship, doesn't mean that they're given equal rights and those outside of 48 are granted even less. Now the reason that Israel has gotten away with this is because the West, even in the face of international standards, allows it to. For instance, UN Resolution 194 said in 1948 that Palestinians should be granted the right of return, and yet Israel still denies them that right without any repercussion. Moreover, Israel's formation violates international law and human rights. Legal definitions consider a number of their basic policies to be illegal, like the occupation of land, the establishment of settlements, the taking of land by force and claiming sovereignty over it, ethnic cleansing, the formation of the apartheid system, engaging in collective punishment, transforming local laws to fit its new system, and erecting barriers like the apartheid wall. Now, this is considered a little bit taboo, but skipping over it feels like I'm not doing my duty as an educator. So I will acknowledge cause and effect because like any other geopolitical context, it deserves acknowledgement. On October 7th, Hamas attacked Israel, claiming the lives of 1,200 people. They took in 200 hostages. And immediately after the attack, Hamas made it clear that this attack was neither random nor impulsive. It was meant to object to the conditions that Gazans are subjected to and to retaliate against Israel's holding of more than 5,200 Palestinian political prisoners, many of which are held without trial or reason. Since October 7th, it has exceeded 10,000. After the attack, Hamas tried to arrange an exchange for the hostages. President of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, refused. Since then, Netanyahu has gone on to order a genocide of Gaza. Since October 7th, Israel has killed more than 30,000 Gazan civilians, not including those under the rubble. 
the average age killed is five years old. Gazan civilians compared to Hamas fighters, murder rate is 92 to 8 percent. This is in Israel, where they boast the most advanced surveillance in the world. If 92 percent of deaths are civilian deaths, it is no accident. It is very much intentional. Furthermore, if it were just Hamas, then we would not see such high mortality rates among Palestinians in the West Bank, where Hamas has no control. Months ago, there was more than a 226% increase in attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank, and I can only guess what that number would be today. Now, I include this not to endorse everything that Hamas has ever done, or to give a comprehensive history, but to acknowledge the media trap that we've been indoctrinated into, because that's something we're going to be assessing today. Because if we lose sight of these facts, then we ignore its context, thereby slipping into a disproportionality that pits Arabs, usually Arab men, as senseless terrorists who act impulsively at the expense of women and children. This extends well into dance where the arts are used to advance narratives of saviorism without critique of systemic injustices. Because if we are concerned about women and children, we should also be livid that Many women and children are among the 10,000 hostages held by Israel, the only state that legally prosecutes children. In this case, exclusively Palestinian children. I say all this to emphasize that this is not just a humanitarian crisis, and we can't lean into Orientalist tropes if we want to dismantle imperialist logic. We are part of this problem, and how we fight it needs to be intentionally, intentionally disruptive of the narratives that we've been fed. Now, carrying all this in mind, you might be thinking one of two things. Why is this the first time I'm hearing about this, and what does this have to do with me? The answers to these questions are on purpose and a lot. The U.S. and the West have strategically uplifted Israel with its imperial interests since its inception. And this absolutely extends into the taxes you pay, the corporations you buy into, and yes, the dance you support. The reason Israel has done all these things is simple. It's because we let them, because our governments benefit from this genocide and they are not going to do anything out of morals. They are going to do it because they have to, because we make them. Now, before we get into some of the actions we can pursue, let's take a minute or so to do a brief overview of how modern dance in the United States is implicated in Zionism detailing some of the systemic barriers that make that uncomfortable truth hard to address. First and foremost, it's hard to parse through Zionism and American modern dance because they are enmeshed in each other. Modern dance's founders, Rue St. Denis, Ted Sean, and Isadora Duncan established the genre based on American ideals of freedom and democracy, as well as the appropriation of the so-called East. It's worth noting that the language we use to describe these figures is pioneers, which is a not so subtle nod to modern dance's entanglement with colonialism. In particular, Ruth St. Denis and Ted Sean focused on Oriental themes, training the next generation of dancers with their pedagogy through the Denis Sean School. Now, before I continue into this history, I want to make a small aside because I think it's a connection that's worth making, even if it does divert us a bit. You're probably reading source material right now about how the media has contributed to the dehumanization of the Arab body since 9-11. These articles are finally talking about the repercussions that come from the constant demonization, villainization, caricaturing, and exposure of the Arab body. They are drawing a through line to black people, men in particular, throughout American history, explaining how we've been conditioned as a society in such a way that when our black brothers and sisters and folks are in pain, the American public is less inclined to have a kinesthetic response to it. And this is a great connection to make for understanding intersectionality and grappling with how tactics used on the black community are applied throughout colonialism. But what these articles are missing is that for the Arab body, this did not begin on 9-11. Frankly, how else would Zionism, a European export of the late 19th century, be successfully wielded to pit one minority group against another, convincing the American public that dispossessing an indigenous population of all faiths was morally just? 
And then we have to extend that line of questioning to ask how it speaks to modern dance. Because though this isn't said aloud, it's past time we acknowledge that modern dance would not exist if it weren't for Orientalism. And it's time we acknowledge that modern dance would not exist if it weren't for colonialism. And it's time that we acknowledge that modern dance would not exist without the appropriation of black dance. And we may pretend that some of these conversations are well underway, but we're not dismantling it at its core. We have movements like Final Bow for Yellowface, which addresses Orientalism, and that's great but it's using Orientalism as a framework without using Orientalism as its framework. Orientalism was founded by Palestinian theorist Edward Said. But it wasn't so that the Nutcracker could have a dance that looked more authentically Chinese. His larger project was to dismantle the imperialist framework of Western thought. And when we lose sight of that, we're doing his work a disservice and we're making it impotent. Anything less than that is a distraction. This isn't about inclusion. It's about a system that needs to be interrogated. So this casual tokenism, which is constant in Israeli propaganda, should easily be recognizable to us because we see it wielded in American discourse all the time. Now, this is important because if we bear it in mind, we can have a more fruitful conversation about what reckoning with the field can look like we can return to its foundations through institutions like the Dineshan School. And instead of labeling it as a bad player in an otherwise spotless field, we can see it for what it is, an entity that existed in relation to a much larger ecosystem. And this gives us a better glimpse into modern dance. Dineshan, in keeping with fad culture and colonial conquests, based its school on Orientalist fantasies. They would then go on to educate the next generation of dancers, including, oops, I'm on the wrong slide. Oh, well. <laughs> including mother of American modern dance, Martha Graham. It's understandable that then Graham, influenced by her education and upbringing, would promote certain harmful ideologies, adjusting her work to align with the changing strategies of colonialism and the emerging Cold War, whether she was aware of it or not. Her work pursued themes that spoke to frontiers, religious iconography, folk dance, manifest destiny, and Orientalism, nicely complementing American imperialism. She also advocated for a modern dance technique that spoke a universal language, one in which the Oriental body served as appropriative source material but was invalid as a subject, thereby aligning with universal humanism. It's important to note that though Graham was not the exclusive figure involved in these efforts, she was an active participant. Diplomats recognized how her work could serve state interests, projecting American ideals of freedom and democracy to counter Russia's aristocratically linked export of ballet. Of course, this was not true freedom. It was a facade to advance colonial projects, and one that was none more successful than when it came to the US normalization of Israel. Fueled by financial support from both the US State Department and the Rothschild family, Graham's influence flourished in Israel and was resonant through shared interests in universalism, expansionism, and romantic individualism. She would even become the artistic director of what is now the Batsheva School in occupied Palestine. She was happy to perform her parts in Israel's normalization projects, even acting as one of the US's first goodwill gestures of Israeli statehood recognition. In return, she expressed her allegiance to Israel, pointing out that her settler lineage in the United States mirrored the new Zionists. Believing she was bringing peace to the Middle East and world citizenship to all who embraced it, her romantic individualism quickly infected the Israeli modern dance scene. Beyond that, her career established a model for the artistic diplomat, which is a theme that I'll discuss shortly. As a case study, Graham demonstrates how modern dance has been directly and indirectly influenced by propaganda efforts. But when we couple it with the field's relationship to dance lineages like that of Oha Naharin, it only becomes that much more significant. What's more, her artistic diplomo dipl diplomacy was not unique. It was very common then, just as it is today. 
However, I want to be mindful of time, so I use Graham just to point out the overarching trend of dance's commodification, one that, especially in the case of Israel, goes largely unmentioned in critical dance studies. I also feel like it's not my, it's like my Arab duty to remind you that there's tea right there. If anybody wants tea, go get your tea. It's hot now, too. Now, the reason that we never talk about this isn't random. It stems from systemic barriers that render talking about this topic culturally taboo. Through funding structures, lobbyists, and progressive theater, criticism of Israel has been labeled anti-Semitic and therefore untouchable, leaving audiences unaware of the apartheid and occupation of Palestine. Additionally, colonial projects deliberately push a narrative that conceals America's involvement in the apartheid of Palestine through a practice called art washing. As a result, it's no surprise that dance scholarship falls into a related trap as curators and decision makers, regardless of their affiliation to Israel, are indoctrinated into apoliticism or both sidisms that inherently favor the oppressor. This likely informs dance academia, where several dance scholars identify as specialists in Israel-Palestine, yet few will ever mention Palestine in their work. When its name is spoken, it is typically through a consolatory footnote, expressing that the conflict is too complex and will therefore be skirted. Of the scant work remaining in this already weighted equation, even less is critical of the occupation. For instance, when scholars discuss its folk dances, they refer to Palestinians as a group whose dances were benevolently passed to the Israeli people before vanishing from the narrative altogether. Mainstream narratives and their controllers advance this phenomenon by feeding us Zionism through major institutions and trends in the field. For example, suppose a dancer is asked to name preeminent dance institutions in the United States. They will likely bring up Gibney and the Joyce Theater which receive funding from the state of Israel and its corporate government proxies, thereby giving Israel stakes in what is produced. When asked to name famous dancers throughout history, names like Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham, Anna Halperin, and Sophie Maslow might be cited, all of whom were or are staunch Zionists. Then we also have to supplement this knowledge with the sheer strength of the Zionist movement in dance. In dance scholarship, major foundations operate as Israeli proxies, proxies sponsoring research that promotes the occupation. Additionally, many Israeli choreographers are funded by Brand Israel, an Israeli campaign dedicated to improving Israel's image to the rest of the world. So when universities and dance companies bring them in to set work, the state of Israel benefits because its funding structure receives a portion of the income and has the power to censor what is produced. The Israeli government knows that the arts, that the arts, I'm scared I'm gonna, we had a lot of issues with this, I'm terrified I'm gonna mess it up. I'm gonna move my leg though, okay. The Israeli government knows that the art it funds is a political tool and a distraction technique. Just look at the recent Israeli Occupation Forces video where soldiers celebrate dancing to Arabic music. They know dance has power, but they also know that that power can be commodified. And beyond direct funding, Zionists use intimidation tactics to determine what goes on in an institution. For example, a few weeks ago, the Dance Studies Association issued a statement subtly supporting Palestine. A couple hours later, it was removed and an apology was issued to all subscribers. After my public call out of them, they privately told me that they had it removed because they received threats from Zionists. In what other context can you imagine that a threat by the oppressor results in a large institution siding with the oppressor publicly? They could have said we received threats, they could have said a number of things, but instead they bowed down and gave in. They recently tried to do damage control by hearing from both sides, but they, they out of themselves as radical and nothing but name. And his, Israel's hold on these institutions is incredible and it cannot be overstated. I maintain personal experiences because of them that would be unthinkable in other contexts. For example, I've been asked um, by multiple dance jobs to conceal that I'm Arab and to change my name. 
When I post pro-Palestinian information online, it is subjected to algorithmic apartheid and harassment. I've had to pull out of conferences. An op-ed piece I wrote once was turned down because they said that its values conflicted with the magazine's funders. Magnify that with the slew of death threats, surveillance, and scrutiny that writers on Palestine are subjected to, and it only becomes that much more damning. In academia, we are expected to produce at the same rate as our colleagues, who are, whose work is not privy to these same barriers. And when we don't, they wonder why their representation is lacking. Now, holding these barriers in mind, I want to shift direction slightly, turning to themes that inform the content of this presentation. The first theme I want to walk through is progressive neoliberalism. Progressive neoliberalism refers to how progressive forces align with capitalism and colonialism to co-opt progressive ideals. Israel and the United States in particular are masters of this, something that I think will best be illuminated through a case study. And perhaps the most accessible and recognizable case study is to look at Gaga technique. Gaga is a dance technique established by Israeli choreographer Oha Naharin. Dance means something, and to say it's above politics allows us to ignore any measures of accountability. Now, with that, I'd like to turn to my second theme, which I like to understand as the other side of the same coin. Earlier, I alluded to the artistic diplomat in the context of Martha Graham. The artistic diplomat pits modern dance as a universal language without considering how power structures operate within it. This perpetuates oppression through false metaphorizations and both sidisms. To articulate how this appears in Israeli American modern dance apparatuses, I'd like to hone in on a case study, namely Israeli American choreographer Svigoth and Debki. Named after an ancient dance of the Levantine region, the piece was funded by organizations in the United States and Israel. It received tremendous accolades and was recognized as the New York Times Top 10 Dances of 2013. Svi Dance went on to tour the piece throughout the United States and abroad, partnering with schools and universities to build a curriculum where students were taught that Debki was an Israeli dance. For some, this may seem harmless, even admirable, for others, it is egregious, albeit nothing short of expected. So using this case study offers us a prime illustration of how power operates in concert dance through the form of cultural exchange, a fallacy made abundantly clear in the context of Palestine and Israel. For context, Debki is a folk and social dance that dates back to the Canaanites. It originates from a stomping technique villagers used on mud roofs to prevent them from caving in during the changing season. The activity would solidify into a dance performed by rural peasants, entering wedding spaces and to some degree was adopted as a form of resistance against the Ottoman Empire. As mentioned before, it's ancient and it's estimated to have formed as early as 3000 BC but I'll skip to the 1900s onward. In 1910, Herbs of the Levant agreed, um, agreed with the British that if they fought the Ottoman Empire, they would be granted independence, a promise that was reneged in the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement and the ensuing Balfour Declaration. The former carved, carved the region into mandates while the latter promised Palestinian land without indigenous knowledge or consent to the Jewish people. As Zionists rooted themselves on the land in greater numbers, they shifted their attention toward establishing an Israeli identity, funding a host of artists, including newly arrived dancer Gurit Kadman and her Israeli folk dance school. There, she taught Debke as an Israeli dance, having learned it from Palestinians nearby. A particularly seductive choice given the dance's ties to the land. From the 1940s to the 1960s, Despite Israel's push to fund and appropriate Palestinian dances, the dance failed to gain momentum among settlers, instead entering the concert realm with Arab dancers often, to hire, often hired to perform the dances as Israeli under Israeli parameters. 
It was not until the Palestinian Liberation Organization rose to prominence that the dance's greatest revolutionary surge would emerge, this time in an unlikely locale, Palestinian refugee camps of Jordan and Lebanon. Crossing social classes, it evolved into a collective protest against the occupiers, spreading from outside its borders to within, which was a sizable enough threat that Israel's government had to respond swiftly through censorship laws, arrests of leaders, the forced closure of cultural centers, checkpoints that prevented Palestinians from performing for each other, and an eventual reattempt to rebrand the dance as Israeli. The latter method took several forms beyond just claiming it. In some instances, Palestinians dancing as protest were misnamed Israeli, promoting notions that their movement was in celebration. Other times, the body of Palestinians protesting was misidentified as Israelis and Palestinians joining hands, thereby suggesting some burgeoning friendship. A third form hybridized the two aforementioned strategies by asserting that Israelis created their own version of the dance as they exchanged ideas as relatively equal stewards of the land, innovating the dance as Arabs maintained it in its static form. Now, likely inspired by this dance and its corresponding propaganda, Gothiner choreographed Debka in 2012, where he was hailed for its authenticity. He described his motivations as one of unity and bridge building to fuse contemporary and folk tastes. But what does this buzzword, bridge building, really mean? Structurally, a bridge is built on equal grounds, suggesting that if you reverse X or Y, or Palestine and Israel, you will yield similar results. But what would it mean if we applied the same concept to Gothiner and that of a Palestinian? To begin, Gothiner is a white man of European descent. He is Israeli American and both countries fund and tour his work. Palestinians on the other hand, depending on where they live, are not always granted passports, and again, depending on where they live, may not be able to return once they leave their homes in Palestine. Just performing for fellow Palestinians may not be possible depending on where they're based. If a Palestinian has a Palestinian passport, it's likely treated as a liability. The few Palestinians given Israeli passports are monitored and widely discriminated against. Palestinians in refugee camps no matter their generation, are seldom given a passport and have no citizenship. Palestinians elsewhere in the diaspora may not have the right to visit, much less tour their ancestral homelands, nor will they be allowed to visit certain countries. If they are able to visit, they will undoubtedly be subject to heavy scrutiny, surveillance, and censorship. They will not have access to national government funding because they are denied a state. Gothiner has none of these limitations. Instead, he is given funding from Israel to tour and profit off of an appropriated dance named Debke, the Arabic word for stomp, in a country with a nation state law that has removed Arabic from its official languages. And yet, despite learning the steps off of YouTube in an era where conversations on cultural appropriation are more prevalent than ever, public grievances were kept at a minimum and primarily came from a largely ignored group of Arabs in the diaspora myself included, during which time Gothiner quietly rebranded his work, hoping that it would soothe our grievances. Perhaps because of this, his work was able to comfortably situate itself for some time relative to the internet's temporality, as the first Google search result for Debke, inspiring a series of US Zionist articles to come out claiming the dance as their own, while unaware audiences left theaters believing that having seen the dance, they were informed of the region's geopolitics, thereby subduing Debka, whose legacy and resistance is meant to defy the occupation, not assimilate and disappear into it. And while I focus on Gothiner's work in particular thus far, I want to emphasize that this argument is not about Gothiner. It's an indictment of the system and logic that fails it a logic that we see play out constantly through ethnic dance festivals that equalize nationalities and experiences against each other, world dance curriculums that attempt to cover each region, etc. 
Gothliner's work is just one illustration of the systemic apparatuses in dance climate that use dance's so-called bridge-building capacity to neutralize its potency. In the case of Gothliner, he learned the steps off YouTube, but he did so in a world where he was made to believe that what he was doing was radical. He did so in a world where funding structures promote Israeli art through Brand Israel, where the apartheid is sanitized through Israel's study abroad complex, and where governments pay dancers to act as diplomats without having any of the credentials to do so. In other words, he did so in a world where he could do all this, not know, and continue to believe that what he was doing was building bridges. Gothliner is just one case study where Israeli modern dance privilege stands out and one that we have to be critical of. In Gothliner, we see instances where artists are rhetorically treated as activists while covertly op acting as operatives, whether they're conscious of it or not. They hide in plain sight, on proscenium stages and program asterisks, funding structures and touring schedules. They are power brokers reifying existing structures through the domestication of diversity and the neutralization of artistic potency. And yet they do so through a number of apparatuses, from technology and diplomatic projects to appropriation, all of which are implicated in each other. This complexity and nuance, however, is not something that we're supposed to acknowledge. And often these artists may not even realize they're engaging in it. What we're supposed to do is claim that dance builds bridges between people. And I'm not saying that it can't, but I am saying that in instances like these, artists are not building bridges. They are creating a static seesaw, a piece of installation art, a stand-in for some relic of utopic equalization, a performative demonstration of tamed difference and an oversimplified identification with the other. This theme, like the previous theme, is not about artists who defy boundaries. It is about artists who exercise their privilege to ignore that those boundaries exist. Now, I know that I've hardly scratched the surface, but I wanna leave room for questions. So I'm gonna to start to wrap this up, but only after a desperately needed call to action. Because though dance is not the only culprit that has allowed this atrocity to unfold, it has been complicit and it's about time we act. We as dancers have an obligation to it. Among the things you can do, is sign and make sure that your institutions sign on to the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Acknowledge your privilege and leverage your voice and platform to educate yourselves and others about the occupation of Palestine. If able, participate in direct actions and attend teach-ins, organize events, write and sign statements of solidarity, engage with your representatives by making calls, and if you have the financial means, contribute to trustworthy organizations. You should also talk to your friends and relatives. You are your community, and you have the chance to have a meaningful conversation with them. These things make a difference, and by taking an action, you're sending a clear signal to our government about where we stand, and creating a safe space for your peers to feel empowered to speak out as well. The dance community prides itself on being an active participant in radical thought. As movers and keepers of culture, we should be on the front lines of this movement. And contrary to your history classes, the United States is often on the wrong side of history. But if we come at them with everything we have, they have to relent. In light of that, one language that the US does speak is, is money. And a way to pressure them is by supporting the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, BDS for short. BDS was established in 2005 to hold governments and companies accountable for the complicity in the Israeli apartheid. It's a Palestinian-led movement and is modeled after the successful boycott that came out of South Africa. It aims to ensure that Palestinians are granted the same rights as Israelis and demands that Israel comply with international law. Its three main goals are end the occupation and colonization, which includes dismantling the apartheid wall, ensure all Palestinians get full equality as citizens, and enable the right of return as outlined in UN Principle 194. It breaks down its movement into campaigns which are academic, cultural, economic, trade union, student solidarity, and local governments. Then there are also global campaigns you can sign on to as well. 
This movement is successful, and we've already seen it have material effects on companies like Puma, Starbucks, and Zara. It's an effective strategy, and its naysayers only exist to neutralize you. It's, I put the speaker notes on the wrong slide, so I'm going to read this, but just know this is the QR code. People are going to tell you that this won't work because they're afraid that it will. Let me just, I'm about to show you a screenshot. Okay, you can read it. And then, like, put your hand on your head when you finish reading it. Yes, I can read it out loud. Okay. It is very tragic. This is from Ohad Naharin. He likes emailing me and everybody else to harass him. Um, this is, he's emailing uh, the person who founded um, Boycott from Within in Israel. It is very tragic and frustrating for many of us in Israel to witness and be part of wrongdoing of our government. Yet you, in your shallow and full of ignorant assumptions, are only adding more junk to what is already overflow junkyard. And the sad thing is that boycotting Batsheva did and will contribute nothing to the Palestinian cause. It is sad since your intentions are obviously good, yet in the real world, your energy built nothing. It's all capital letters. This is not an invitation for debate. It is an invitation to come see our shows, Ohad. <laughs> he sends some wild emails. I have some that I'm not going to show because He'll sue me, but <laughs> yeah, he's in some wild ones. OK. Now, this screenshot, when people have a major reaction like this, it's because they know that you're a threat. This screenshot was sent as an exchange with the founder of Boycott From Within, who last I talked to was awaiting trial. But it does show me that together we can affect change. And it's about time we affect that change in, in Palestine. Um, we're going to have more conversations about BDS shortly, but uh, I do want to make that really clear because these things do make a difference. It's about time that we rise up and we speak out, telling politicians and oppressive regimes that if they continue down the path of supporting illegal occupations, they will continue without the support of artistic voices. We need to put an end to the superficial discourse surrounding decolonization and direct that energy toward material change. Artists need to be on the side of the revolution. Anything less than that, is a disservice to our craft. A free Palestine is within our lifetime. I do believe that. Now, we need to make that happen. Thank you, and I will turn it over to Nicole. So my first question is about BDS, and it's related to uh, the question of uh, artistic boycott, because a lot of people somehow can can um, can stand for boycotting big corporations but then but then kind of balk at, at the idea of, of boycotting artists. So um, millions of dollars are given to Israeli artists through the Brand Israel program that you mentioned. And the state of Israel invests in cultural work because it's a strategic tool for nation building and whitewashing human rights abuses. So therefore, cultural boycott is a very powerful tool for resistance against the Israeli state. And I hear many people say it's OK to boycott corporations, but don't boycott artists. And, and I spend quite a bit of time trying to educate artists and art patrons around why they should boycott Batsheva, for example. And I'd love to hear your argument for why it's essential to extend the boycott to Israeli state-funded dance companies. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm going to have like a couple of notes up here because otherwise I would go on a rant and I would get so off that you, yeah, okay. So uh, <laughs> I do get, I, I get asked this question quite a bit and I think that one of the things that we have to be really honest with ourselves about is what we are and what we do as artists. Um, in our grants, we're out here talking about diversity and inclusion and um, you know all of these radical ideas and we have all these clauses upon clauses about how dance is a political tool, but then when it's time to talk about collective liberation, we're all kind of quiet about that. Um, I think that uh, we're keen to, this is something that's been coming up quite a bit, is host like healing circles and things like that instead of actually taking action, because that would come at a cost for us. Um, but dance is political. It's always political. It's not only political when it's convenient to us. 
Um, and Israel knows the dance is political. Uh, we know the dance is political, but we also need to, to reckon with what we can do to, to make sure that people re react ethically, because this isn't about canceling your favorite choreographer and then moving on. You can cancel them and you can add them to your like societal shit list and then like we can have somebody else come up and it's doing the same stuff. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to change the system itself. Um, and BDS was actually launched in the wake of um, right after, no, so BDS was launched in 2005, Friend Israel was launched in 2006 as a result of that. And it was a bunch of consultants uh, from England and the US who were uh, brought in to create this program that was supposed to show um, Israel's prettier face is actually like what they published. That's very public. Um, and so they've used this strategy and it's been effective. But then more so like after 2008, um, they were bombing Gaza and people were obviously reacting negatively to that uh, and they were creating committing all these kinds of war crimes. So when people spoke up about that, uh, the first thing that they did was invest more money into um, the cultural brand Israel sector. So we know that they're using this successfully. So we can't make that argument that, you know, it doesn't make a difference and art supersedes politics because it doesn't. It's very much invested in politics. And if we don't acknowledge that, then that's just contributing to the cause. And I think if I read this, it's gonna be worse. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and also one thing um, I think it's important to add that you mentioned the boycott from within, and it's um, for those who don't know, that is a movement from within Israel. So, a lot of people um, who balk at the idea of cultural boycott might feel bad, like, oh, um, you know, it's it's personal or it's hurtful to these artists. But just to remember that there are also Israelis who are advocating for boycott from within. And then also, to, yeah, as you said, it's not about cancel culture, it's not personal, and that it is a, a really effective strategy to create uh, conditions in which Israel is a, a social pariah, and that um, that can sometimes even have more teeth than, than uh, financial boycotts. Because we know that art doesn't really have a lot of money, so. Yeah, um, that's true. Anything you want to add about that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that I hear is specifically this attack on Bathsheba, and there are companies that are doing the work without having to use the Israeli government. There are people that do that, um, but the Israeli government, part of signing into Brand Israel is that you sign a pledge that you are a cultural ambassador for the state, and it also includes that all of your work will promote Israel in a positive light. So when you do that, when you make that um, kind of pledge onto it, then you are being censored and your work is directed toward that direction. So what, what we see is not actually what Israel is. It's, it's deliberately, you know, that, that's what we don't want in the arts, right? Like the NEA, that was um, in the 60s and 70s, people denied money from the NEA because of what their censorship laws were. Why would this be any different? Mm -hmm. Great. So um, moving on to Gaga, Gaga Technique. Um, so in the article that I, I recommend everyone read, uh, it's called A Dancing Body Offers Legitimacy to the State by Ido Fetter and Shira Kim. Those two authors discuss Gaga as a form of spiritual bypassing. So uh, it, it enables Israelis to release tension from their mandatory military service. So that's mandatory, almost everyone does it except for the refuseniks. And so most Israeli dancers you see on stage have um, hold that trauma of having um, committed atrocities or at least like participated in the in the military apparatus and so um, Gaga and, and things like that like somatic practices in Israel can often be used as a form of spiritual bypassing and um, so besides the fact that Gaga is a legitimate boycott target due to the Israeli state funding that was used to create that form um, I'm wondering if you can speak to some of the other reasons why this movement practice is boycottable, like such as this way that it's used to obfuscate violence and, and soothe apartheid guilt. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of somatic practices slip into this, um, like kind of corporatized somatic practices where they take indigenous knowledge or, or whatever, whatever their ideas that are beneath them, whatever is built into the idea is um, then used to kind of tell everybody to turn within and to not focus on the collective, which is something that Gaga does. 
But Gaga also um, promotes this idea, everybody has t-shirts and stay available, that's their motto. That's not unlike um, what the IDF's motto is, is always ready to defend itself. And that's kind of the same idea. So I think that this concept of bypassing is actually quite true, in that it's bypassing any, um, it, it absolves oneself of any actual wrongdoing. I think a lot of times we use somatics to do that, to instead of holding the tensions in our body, which we absolutely should have, we decide to reject them by going into our own space because once you heal yourself, everything else in the world is healed. And that is like the, the poster child of like what neoliberalism is, right? So like, why, do we, why, do we, why are we okay with this is, is I guess my bigger question. And also, how is this being used to serve people like the IDF? I mean, frankly, I also think it's quite strange that Gaga, if you look at it, it differentiates between Gaga people and Gaga dancers. It's kind of like an apartheid system. Also, why would you differentiate people and dancers? Um, it's, it's super bizarre. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think there are a lot of ideas you can go with that. And, and all that being said, I mean, I can't study Gaga. I would have, or I can study it, but I can't be certified in it. I can't go to Israel. I can't go every three years. It's also really, really expensive to do that in the first place. The prompts are highly guarded. You can't change the wording. It's like very catered to that. You, I mean, you can't record it at all. It's available to everybody. Also, how is it a movement practice that um, is like totally free? And they say that it's fully improvisational, but everybody kind of comes out of it like looking a little bit the same. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's also a little sketchy, but you know, <laughs> this is why I use notes. <laughs> Okay, this is my last question and then we'll open it up. Okay, so your description of the appropriation and censorship of Debke further illustrates the power of dance to perform national identity. Otherwise, why would they, why would they appropriate it? So if it were not powerful, uh, mid 20th century Israelis would not have worked so hard to steal and invisibilize Palestinian dance. In the book, which um, is actually quite dense, I, I don't recommend reading this as your primer, but this book, um, Dance and Authenticity in Israel and Palestine, Performing the Nation by Elke Cashel, the author discusses the way Palestinians have asserted their identities in dance lineages through performing modified versions of Debke on the concert stage, so they changed it uh, due to the way that their dance form was appropriated. So um, I'm curious, what other ways do you see the apartheid and lack of freedom of movement impacting and shaping the development of Palestinian dance? Yeah, Palestinian dance is, it's a huge life force, um, but it also changes. So here's what I like to think of it as, like, so in Detka, there's, in, when you're like at a wedding, not on, on stage, but when you're at a wedding, you have the Ross, which is the leader, and they're doing like all the skilled, the skilled stuff. And that, like, you can't just go up there and be like, I want to lead. Like, people would be like, get out. Um, which is fair, because they're doing the really hard stuff. They're communicating with the drummer, and they're determining the speed and, and kind of what they're doing. And the second and third people in the line, they're going to um, kind of support whoever that leader is. And then everybody else is doing basically the same thing. They're, they're just keeping it, the rhythm. So I like to think of them as the heartbeat of the dance. So your heartbeat is going to change when you're responding to different things that are going on around you. There's this urgency. So, you know, responding to the moment, your heartbeat is going to change. And I think in the same way, Palestinian dances react that way. So that's important to think about when we look at these dances. We don't want to just go back to the past and romanticize something. We want to look at how it's actually evolved in relation to, to changing needs. Um, but, it, you know, it still pulses life into the people. Um, so I, I think that in a, in a similar way, Palestinian dances have sometimes had to be sneaky. Sometimes for, for people in 48, they've reacted very differently than in Gaza. And also the fact that the diaspora has totally influenced what the dance looks like and feels like, and it's changing movement. Um, they even use songs. So there's actually, there's a, there's a ballad that actually changes with each generation in accordance with changing political needs. So it's this song, Zarif al Kul. It's like, it is, it's, there are different lyrics, but it has no known author. Um, it kind of, it sings about this man who is singing to this woman who he's in love with, uh, presumably, and he's saying, you know, 
Um, if you leave Palestine, you'll, you'll, never, you'll forget us and you'll forget the land and all of these things. And it's actually a call to the diaspora. Um, and that's how Devko evolved, was that it was being suppressed so heavily in Palestine that it largely relied on Jordan and Lebanon's refugee camps to influence that. And now they dance in the face of, I mean, you've seen they, they dance in the face of snipers and all kinds of things. So I'm not going to say that the Israeli oppression isn't awful, because it is, but um, the Palestinian resilience is also really, really strong. And that's really definitely informed it, even when um, freedom of movement is taken away, the dance still goes on.